Okay, so uh, yesterday we were discussing something about the, the evolution of desks, and we finished up uh, discussing uh, the role of uh, uh, models in which uh, turbulence, internal angular momentum transport was what was driving um, disk evolution. So we didn't discuss anything yesterday about, um, about disk winds, except for a brief mention of them. So I think I'm actually going to defer the discussion of disk winds till the final lecture when we're talking about disk dispersal. Uh, and that fits quite naturally there, and then we have a little bit of space there to discuss uh, disk winds. So what I'd like to uh, get on to today is to get on to this uh, fairly central question um, let's see, of uh, what might actually be causing uh, turbulence um, within, within disks. And this was a question that a number of you um, posed yesterday. So uh, in this morning's uh, lecture, I'm going to be discussing this question of what might be causing turbulence, and then that will lead on to the discussion this afternoon um, of how turbulence and maybe other processes um, may be contributing to producing the episodic accretion that we heard something about um, yesterday. Okay, so when we think about turbulence, we have um, both multiple, multiple motivations for thinking about turbulence and also a number of different sources that might generate that um, turbulence. So we'll, we'll go through both of those um, in, uh, in turn. So if we think about motivations, first of all, the one we've uh, mostly been discussing uh, so far has been angular momentum transport, the idea that turbulence within the disk, within the gas disk, might mix angular momentum from small scales to large scales, and that that mixing of angular momentum is what is causing gas to flow into the star um, and be accreted. So it could be responsible for disk evolution. Um, it can play a role in generating episodic accretion. It will also be very important for planet disk interactions, which we haven't heard about yet, but which I think will be probably an important topic uh, towards the end of the week. Now, there are other places where turbulence matters, which are more directly connected to the evolution of solids and different stages of uh, planet formation. So one of those issues, which we've already heard uh, alluded to yesterday, is radial and vertical mixing or diffusion of solid particles. And one basic question there would be, if we have a gas disk with some initially small solid particles in it, are those particles able to sediment into a thin layer near the midplane where their collision rates would be higher, whereas we heard yesterday they might be gravitationally unstable to directly collapsing into planetesimals. Obviously, turbulence, if there's too much of it, will inhibit that process and keep particles stirred up. Now, a separate uh, aspect of turbulence is that in addition to diffusing particles, so spreading them out, um, we also know that turbulence of various kinds can also concentrate particles. Some of you may have seen those um, rather unpleasant sort of environmental pictures of great trash piles of plastic in the oceans. We have uh, large uh, vortex-like motions in the oceans which collect uh, little pieces of plastic trash uh, in uh, huge uh, collections. Now, in the context of planet formation, that kind of thing might be quite good. If we can bring a lot of solid material into a small volume, we have many, many extra ways in which we might form, uh, form planetesimals um, and so forth later uh, from that uh, process. Okay, so those are the motivations. Now, we also have multiple sources um, of turbulence. So I'm going to try and draw up here a little uh, flow chart, um, which may uh, only serve to convince you that the problem is hopeless um, and that there's far too many possibilities and that we can't understand anything. Okay? So hopefully it won't do that, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. So the first distinction we might make um, is between turbulence that involves the gas only versus turbulence that intrinsically involves the gas and the particles. And yesterday, uh, when Willie was showing some uh, calculations of Kelvin-Helmholtz instability in settled particle layers, you know, that was an example of a process that clearly involves both the gas and the particles. So if we think just about the gas only, the first question we might ask is what physical processes in the disk are responsible for driving that turbulence? Are they purely hydrodynamic processes, so just involving the fluid equations and nothing more complicated? Does it intrinsically involve magnetic fields? Does it involve gravity? Does it involve thermal effects in the gas? Things are analogous, let's say, to convection, which therefore depend on the entropy of the, um, of the fluid. And there are different possibilities in each of these, uh, in each of these bins. Okay? So if we think about purely hydrodynamic turbulence, there are no well-understood instabilities that produce hydrodynamics, produce turbulence, if the only thing going on in the protoplanetary disk is hydrodynamics. However, there is discussion still uh, remaining that there may be um, uh, instabilities that could produce vortices, 
um, in that purely hydrodynamic limit. And I won't actually discuss that further uh, today, though it will be mentioned in the, uh, in the written version of the lectures. When magnetic fields are involved, we have this process called the magnetorotational instability that we've already heard a little bit about that I'll say more about today. When we have self-gravity, we have the tomb ray instability, um, which applies to self-gravitating systems, including galaxies, as well as uh, protoplanetary disks. Now, when we have uh, entropy-driven instabilities, there's a distinction between linear and nonlinear instabilities, and we'll say a little bit about that distinction later. Uh, in terms of linear instabilities, there's something called the vertical shear instability, which I'll describe. Uh, nonlinear instabilities, there's something called the baroclinic instability that we'll say more about uh, later in the week. There may be another way of producing uh, vortices. So these are all purely gas phase processes. For these purposes, it doesn't really matter if the disk has any uh, solids in it um, uh, at all. Now, when we do have a uh, gas, uh, we have another distinction, gas and particles. We have a distinction between instabilities that purely depend on the particles feeling some feedback from the gas. This will be this radial drift, which we heard something about yesterday and we'll hear more about uh, later in the week. Uh, but then there are other instabilities that involve a two-way feedback where the particles uh, experience aerodynamic drag against the gas, but then the gas uh, experiences a momentum transfer from the particles, and so they're both sort of playing on, a, on, an, equal, on an equal role. And so in this uh, just pure particle feedback uh, limit, we have this Kelvin-Helmholtz type of instability. If a dust layer becomes too thin, it will start stirring up by Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, which will maybe concentrate particles, but also thicken it, as we saw yesterday. Uh, if we have this two-way feedback, we have a process called the streaming instability um, that I'll be saying more about um, tomorrow. So in total here, we have you know, quite a large number of different uh, turbulent possibilities. OK, so let's first of all think um, about the simplest limit, which would be, which would be fluid turbulence. Okay. And the issues with fluid turbulence are fairly, uh, fairly easily um, described. So when we have fluids and we're thinking about turbulence, uh, the quantity we normally uh, define is known as the Reynolds number. Okay? And it's the product of some uh, characteristic size scale in the system L, some characteristic velocity U, divided by the molecular viscosity. And I emphasize here that this is the molecular viscosity, the microphysical viscosity in the fluid, not any kind of uh, effective viscosity that arises um, from turbulence. And if we uh, plug in some numbers here, let's assume we're dealing with characteristic velocities of the order of kilometers per second, size scales of the order of astronomical units, and use the same estimate we had yesterday for the value of the molecular viscosity, you get a very large number um, for, the, for the Reynolds number. So Reynolds himself, uh, when he was thinking about turbulence, was looking at flow of water through pipes and other classic experiments like that. And what he found was that when the Reynolds number of course, he didn't call it the Reynolds number then, I think, because he wasn't that uh, vain. Um, when the Reynolds number was too high, the flow through the pipes went from being ordered and laminar to be becoming turbulent. And in terrestrial uh, systems, that transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow occurs for Reynolds numbers that maybe are of the order of 1,000 or thereabouts. So you know, much, much smaller than this value of 10 to the 12 that you have in protoplanetary disks. So what that says, in fact, is that if there is turbulence present within protoplanetary disks, it will be very fully developed turbulence. It will be what we describe as a large inertial range between the stirring motions that are generating the turbulence and the small scales on which the microscopic viscosity in the fluid um, is dissipating that turbulent energy. So if you, I guess, took a purely terrestrial perspective, you would say this enormous Reynolds number would suggest that protoplanetary disks are very turbulent systems, and we shouldn't really worry about what is generating the turbulence. However, if you take a more astrophysical perspective, it turns out to be rather difficult to understand how you might get turbulence started in the first place despite this very large Reynolds number. And the problem here dates back to other old results. If you have a shear flow, so a flow in which there is a gradient in the velocity from one place to the other, and it's in the context of a Keplerian disk, the stability of that shear flow is given by a very simple criteria, so-called Raleigh criteria, and that condition is that the specific angular momentum L of the fluid has to be a decreasing function um, of radius. And that's the condition for instability um, of the flow. Now, as we said yesterday, uh, in a Keplerian disk, the specific angular momentum just goes as the radius to the one-half power, the plus one-half power. So Keplerian disks are linearly stable 
to small hydrodynamic perturbations. If we take an initially completely laminar disk and we just give it a microscopic and infinitesimal perturbation, uh, those perturbations will exponentially decay with time and they won't start growing into, uh, into turbulence. So the simplest mechanism, linear hydrodynamic instability, does not operate in disks to generate, uh, to generate turbulence. Okay, so linear hydrodynamic instability does not work. Um, are there any other instabilities that do work? And it turns out there's a number of instabilities that could be operating in disks um, to generate um, turbulence. So let me first of all just give a little description, a uh, sort of semi-mathematical semi description um, of what we're really talking about when we're thinking about these um, linear instabilities. So the basic picture is we imagine a simplified disk model. So we don't generally try to model all of the physical processes that would be going on in the disk at one time, but rather we consider a simplified model that con contains some set of physical processes. Okay? So a very simple model, for example, might be an isothermal model where you assume that there is no temperature variation in the fluid. The gas all has the same uh, temperature. Magnetohydrodynamics, where you consider the coupling of magnetic fields to the fluid, might be another model. Self-gravity might be another model, um, and so forth. And given that set of physical processes, you first define an equilibrium background state for how the gas would be flowing um, within the disk. You then consider the set of equations you've considered to be important. You linearize them, so you discard the, the nonlinear terms, and you make some perturbation. So for example, you take uh, the fluid and imagine perturbing it in space with some vector s, which has a, a, a dependence of this kind, e to the i omega t minus kr, where k here would be some wave number and omega would be some uh, frequency. So you take this perturbation, you substitute it into the linearized equations, and then you solve for what this omega uh, here uh, is, what this frequency is. And if this omega squared is less than zero, omega itself will be complex. Multiply that by i here, you'll get a real number in front of this time dependence. And so that will imply you have exponentially growing and exponentially decaying uh, solutions. So the condition for linear instability is that this omega squared, when you go through this procedure, ends up being uh, less than zero. Okay. So that's what we mean by these linear instabilities. The main instabilities we're interested in are also local in the sense that if you took just a small patch of disk rather than the whole two pi of the disk, you could derive the instabilities and work out their growth rates within that small volume of the disk rather than having to consider the whole disk along with its um, boundary conditions. Okay. So what we're interested in is first of all the existence of these kind of instabilities, uh, which kind of physical processes give rise to these instabilities, how fast do they grow, and then what happens when we go beyond the exponentially growing phase, the linear phase, and instead look at the phase where they develop into fully developed uh, turbulence. So let's go through the, the, different, uh, the different possibilities here, and I'm just going to try to illustrate uh, which combinations of physical processes are important in these different um, instabilities, or at least are critical to these different um, instabilities. So the first of them is the magnetorotational instability. Um, which dates back to work by Balbus and Hawley in the early 90s. There's a very nice review in Reviews of Modern Physics from 1998 that really would be a, a very good place to look if you want uh, more details um, of these derivations. And the physics here, the critical physics, is hydrodynamics and magnetic fields. So other things, self-gravity, thermal physics, are not essential um, for, this, for this instability, though of course in a real disk they would, uh, they would also be present. So the general setup uh, for looking at this kind of instability is something like this. Uh, we consider a small patch of the disk uh, at some distance R0 from the central star, and we set up a little Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, and z would be out of the plane of the screen here. And then for the simplest analysis, we consider a vertical magnetic field which threads um, that patch of disk and is uniform in the radial and the azimuthal direction. We then imagine perturbing that vertical magnetic field uh, radially. So we get some perturbed field lines that have a little bit of a bend here. And we ask, is that perturbation to the magnetic field um, a stable or an unstable perturbation? And the basic physics is that this is an unstable situation. And the simplest way to try to visualize why that might be so is that this magnetic field has some tension. If you take a magnetic field line and try to bend it, the magnetic field line tries to snap back into a, into a straight configuration. And when we make this perturbation, 
our, our magnetic field, which is acting a little bit like a spring here, is linking fluid elements at different radii in the disk. You see, we've perturbed radially here the magnetic field, so we're linking fluids at different places. Now, those fluids are differentially rotating. Gas in the interior of the disk is trying to rotate faster than the gas further out. So the magnetic field is linking places with different rotation, and then as the disk shears those magnetic fields out, the tension in the magnetic field tends to transport angular momentum from the inside um, to the outside. So we end up with, a, with an unstable situation um, with this kind of perturbation. Now, if one goes through that mathematically, uh, you end up with a dispersion relation, in other words, uh, a relationship between the wavelength of the perturbation and the uh, frequency uh, that you get out when you solve those linearized equations that looks something like this. So here we have different scales. This would be uh, large, small scales off to the right, large scales off to the left. And here we have the uh, stability um, of the system. And if we're below this dashed line here, reflecting omega squared equals zero, we're in the unstable regime, where perturbations would grow exponentially. And so what one finds here is that there's rather a large range of wavelengths where the system would be unstable, and it would only be stable um, if the magnetic field, and hence the alpha end speed, which is entering into this expression here, um, is too strong. So if you have a weak vertical magnetic field, it will be unstable. If you have a very strong vertical magnetic field threading the disk, then the tension in the magnetic field lines might be so strong that you won't actually be able to bend the magnetic field lines at all, and the, and the rigidity of the magnetic field um, will, keep it, will keep it stable. But for a large range of scales and magnetic fields, we have instability in this uh, MHD um, system. Now, you also have a most unstable wavelength where this omega squared has its largest negative value. And the characteristic thing about this magnetorotational instability is that the a most unstable wavelength has a growth rate, omega, little omega, which is approximately the same as the Keplerian angular velocity. So you see what we're plotting here is the growth rate normalized to the square of the Keplerian um, angular velocity. So this implies that such a system, a disk threaded by a weak vertical magnetic field, is really very violently unstable. If you make a perturbation to it, those perturbations grow exponentially on a time scale that's something like omega to the minus one. So in one orbit, you'd get something like two pi exponential e-foldings um, of the growth of the instability. So very rapidly, you'll go from a very small perturbation to a very, very large uh, perturbation, and in practice, um, fully developed um, turbulence. So if you consider this, the, the condition for the disk to be unstable, this is all in ideal MHD, I should say, so no damping processes, is simply that the radial gradient of the angular velocity squared is less than zero. So if you have Keplerian angular velocity, this omega squared is one over r cubed, so we do have a negative gradient there, and we will always be in the unstable regime. So this is described as the, the magnetorotational um, instability. Now, this was uh, derived, worked out, as I was saying, uh, by Balbison Hawley, 1991. Um, this is an interesting sort of little, uh, side note here. There's a little bit of interesting history here. Um, the same mathematics, the same physics, um, was worked out much earlier than that by Chandrasekhar. So Chandrasekhar has a famous book on the stability of rotating fluids. And these instabilities are worked out in that book. And also by Velikov, um, who was working in the Soviet Union and worked this out at about the same time in the, uh, in the 1960s. So those are, at least Chandrasekhar's, uh, it's quite a mathematical treatment. Um, but it's interesting that Safranov, who did a lot of early work on, on planet formation and wrote a very influential book on planet formation in the early 1970s, came very, very close to understanding the importance of Chandrasekhar's work for the stability of protoplanetary disks. And this is a, a page from his book uh, discussing Chandrasekhar's stability criteria, which we now know as the, the MRI. And after writing it down, he notes, this result is somewhat unexpected, since the above does not reduce to Raleigh's criterion when H, which is the magnetic field strength here, goes to zero. For a vanishingly small field, when omega so omega, that's uh, R, a Keplerian omega, is a monotonic function of R. The necessary and sufficient condition for instability is that omega increase with R. In the protoplanetary cloud, omega decreases with R. So Safran actually had basically a complete understanding of uh, how Chandrasekhar's result would apply to protoplanetary disks. 
And so you might think, okay, well, uh, I mean, this was quite a, this was a, a, a well, well-known book. It was even translated into English in the early, uh, in the early 70s. Uh, unfortunately, if you go to the next page of this book, uh, he actually then misunderstands another piece of Chandrasekhar um, and takes the view that if there's a vanishingly small real viscosity, this instability does not operate. So he came very, very close to understanding uh, the MRI back in, back in the early 70s, um, but then just, uh, just failed uh, to get the final piece of physics. Okay, so that's for ideal MHD, and the conclusion in ideal MHD, when there's no damping processes, uh, in other words, in the condition where the disk would be very well ionized, is that those disks would always be violently unstable. So when we think about accretion onto systems that are well ionized, so black hole accretion disks, accretion disks around white dwarfs and neutron stars and so forth, there's not really any doubt that turbulence and angular momentum transport in those systems is generated by the magnetorotational instability. However, when we think about protoplanetary disks, we have a number of additional complications. Okay? And those complications arise from the things we were talking about yesterday, the fact that the ionization fraction in protoplanetary disks is very small, and therefore the coupling between the magnetic field and the fluid is a rather non-trivial question. And in some cases, the coupling may be rather weak because the ionization fraction is really um, so small. So in principle, there are three different effects we have to, uh, we have to consider. One of which is the simplest, is that if we have a current in the disk, it, that current will decay due to collisions between the charge carriers um, and other species in the disk. So we describe that as ohmic dissipation um, of, the, uh, of the current, um, and that will tend to damp these MHD instabilities. Then we have other effects. Um, one is that the magnetic field directly only couples to the charged particles, right? The neutral particles don't care if there's a magnetic field um, in the fluid. Now, in a poorly ionized disk, most of the fluid is the neutral particles rather than the ionized particles. If we want to have an instability in the whole fluid, there has to be some coupling between those two species. And in practice, what happens is that that coupling is provided by collisions between the neutral species and the ions. Now, the rate of those collisions will depend on the density. And if the density is very low, the rate of collisions may be rather small. And so the ionized species and the neutral species will become effectively decoupled. Now, this is a process that's described as ambipolar diffusion. And it's very important in star formation, where, of course, the densities are very low. And it turns out it remains important in places in the protoplanetary disk where the density is relatively low. So that would be typically uh, large distances from the star and in the disk atmosphere, um, even on small scales. And then there's a third effect, which is that if we have charge carriers, say electrons, which are trying to move through a magnetic field, they will be deflected by the Lorentz force uh, as they try to move through that magnetic field. And then, because they're deflected, their motion in the, in the other direction, in the deflected direction, will give rise to a new current, which in turn will create its own magnetic field. Okay? So this is a process known as the Hall effect um, that one tends to encounter in physics. Um, typically in solid state um, applications. When you have semiconductors, and you have electrons uh, moving through the semiconductors in the presence of a magnetic field. So taken together, these three effects, ohmic uh, diffusion, ambipolar diffusion, and the Hall effect, are described as non-ideal MHD processes. And in, a, in rough terms, they tend to damp the action of the magnetorotational instability in places where the ionization fraction is sufficiently low. So we need to consider each of them basically in turn, together with a chemical model for the disk, which specifies what the ionization fraction actually is, in order to know whether these MHD instabilities will really give rise um, to turbulence. OK, so let me uh, describe briefly how this works, um, focusing just on the case of ohmic dissipation, which turns out to be the easiest one and the only one which one can, uh, which one can do simply. So what's written up here is the full induction equation for the evolution of the magnetic field given these various non-ideal effects. So this first term here, curl of V cross B, is just the term that is describing ideal MHD. So this is describing the physics uh, where we have a moving fluid, the magnetic field is locked into that fluid and being dragged around by the motion um, of, the, uh, of the fluid with some velocity field uh, V. And then we have these non-ideal terms. This ohmic term depends on the magnetic diffusivity eta, which is inversely proportional to the conductivity, times the curl of the magnetic field. So we've got two curls here. So this is basically a diffusion term where the diffusion coefficient is this magnetic um, diffusivity. And then we have the Hall effect, ambipolar diffusion, 
Uh, Ne here is the electron number density, J is the current, and gamma here is basically the collision rate between ions and neutral species, with density rho i for the ions um, and rho for the, uh, for the neutrals. So if we just considered ideal MHD, we'd be in this limit uh, that was discussed by Balbus and Hawley. And what's found there from looking at the, the dispersion relation is that on a scale h, where we take that to be the disk thickness, the time scale for the MRI to grow is something like h divided by the alphane speed um, in the fluid, the speed at which uh, magnetic waves would propagate um, along the field lines. Now, if instead we consider just this diffusion term, this has a diffusion uh, character, so this leads to damping on a normal diffusion time scale. So again, if we consider a scale h, which is the disk thickness, the time scale on which this term would tend to damp the magnetic field would be something like the square of that characteristic scale divided by the uh, diffusion coefficient um, eta there. Now, if we then say the condition for the damping process to beat out the growth process is something like that they have characteristically uh, co comparable time scales, we just set those things equal, and we get a condition for the MRI to be damped, which is that this diffusivity uh, has to be larger than the product of the disk thickness times um, the alphane speed there. Okay? Now, what you need to do then is to convert this magnetic diffusivity into a conductivity and relate that conductivity to the electron fraction. So there's some extra steps there which I'm going to uh, skip over. Um, but if you consider this in the inner disk region, the result you will get is that this critical uh, diffusivity corresponds to an electron fraction Xe, which is something like 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 12. So an electron fraction above that level would be large enough to couple the magnetic field to the fluid well enough that these magnetic instabilities would grow. An electron fraction below that level, the two fluids would be, uh, the magnetic field would be decoupled from the fluid, and you would tend to damp any MHD instabilities uh, that, are, that are present there. So this argument, and in particular this very low critical value of the electron fraction that you get out of this argument, is why we were worrying yesterday about really rather weak ionization processes, right? We were interested in ionization processes that give us uh, ionization levels that are at this 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13 uh, level. So very weakly ionized, may be good enough to have MHD instabilities, but too weakly ionized, um, those instabilities um, will, be, will be damped. So this argument dates back to work by Charles Gammy in the 90s. Uh, here it's just considering the ideal MHD in the omic terms, um, these other terms can also be important, as we'll see. Those generally have a more complex effect on the evolution of magnetic fields. So we'll, we'll say something about that uh, later. But if we just consider uh, that simple argument, the sort of qualitatively, qualitative picture we get um, is this one, which again dates back to this, uh, this work by Charles Gammy. And this is sometimes described as the dead zone picture for accretion in protoplanetary disks. So the idea is, if we go from small scales to large scales, we have a number of different regions in the disk which can be characterized by how strong the ionization is, what the ionization fraction is, and therefore how the MHD processes would operate in that region of the disk. So if we're sufficiently close to the star, the temperature in the disk will be above 1,000 Kelvin, and we said yesterday that above 1,000 Kelvin, the alkali metal should be ionized, and that will give us a large enough ionization for the magnetorotational instability to be fully active. So in this inner region of the disk, it will have rather a turbulent flow. This is a simulation of that kind of turbulence, um, where the magnetic fields are basically fully coupled to the fluid. So within maybe a tenth of an AU, or thereabouts, a few tenths of an AU, um, basically the disk will look very much like a disk around a black hole. The magnetic fields will be interacting very strongly um, with the gas. Now when we go further out, the thermal ionization will be very weak, and instead the ionization we have to consider are these non-thermal processes, which predominantly are coming from external sources of ionization to the disk. So in particular, there will be X-rays produced uh, in, the, in the stellar corona, in the magnetosphere of the star, and those X-rays will be shining down on the surface of the disk and ionizing the surface, the surface layers. So the picture we might have then is that the surface layers may be somewhat active because the ionization level is relatively high, but in the mid-plane, where the density is much higher and those regions are shielded from the ionization sources, the turbulence will be very strongly quenched. 
Those inner regions will be dead, and there will not be much turbulence, not much magnetic turbulence anyway, um, in those regions. Then if we go further out, these X-rays may be able to penetrate, and the cosmic rays may be able to penetrate the whole column of the disk, but we will eventually get to a region where this amber polar diffusion dominates because of the very low densities, and that will also quench the role of these MHD instabilities. And then throughout this whole region, uh, the Hall effect can also be playing a role, um, as we'll describe a little bit later. So the picture here, if we just consider MHD instabilities, is that really the structure of the disk and how turbulent it should be in different places is really quite directly linked to how well ionized it is, which in turn is this balance between ionization and recombination um, we were discussing uh, yesterday. So I think maybe we'll take a, a five-minute pause at, at this point, uh, and then we'll go on and consider some different instabilities um, after that. Thank you.
one minute. Okay. <clears throat> so that was that was that was MHD. What other possibilities? Uh, what other possibilities do we do we have? So another next possibility is uh, is self gravity, and so in this uh, little uh, uh, diagram of the physics here, here we're thinking about hydrodynamics and uh, self gravity. Uh, we're ignoring magnetic fields, um, at least in the linear instability. We're ignoring uh, thinking about the the energy equation. So the instability condition um, in this case has been much uh, much longer known. It was worked out in the context of uh, galaxies uh, back in the 60s uh, by Toomey, and it's typically defined in terms of the Toomey Q parameter, which is this, which in a Keplerian disk is defined this way. It's the product of the sound speed, the angular velocity. Divided by the the surface density. Okay, so the Toomey Q reflects a sort of rather complex three-way balance between thermal pressure, which in this expression comes in through the sound speed, rotation, which comes in through through omega, which reflects how much shear there is in the disk, and then gravity, which comes in through sigma, reflecting how massive um, the the disk is. And the condition for instability is that this Q needs to be smaller than some critical value. In other words, the disk needs to be sufficiently massive. Sigma needs to be high enough, or the disk needs to be cold enough, so the sound speed is low enough. And roughly speaking, this critical Q is of order unity. It's typically somewhere between between one、um, and two. Now, you can convert this condition, which is a, a linear condition for instability, to an estimate of the disk mass you need to become unstable. And very roughly, this requires that the disk mass, as a fraction of the stellar mass, needs to be larger than about h over r. Okay, h over r, remember, is the thickness of the disk divided by the distance from the star, and that's a number maybe that's of around 0.05 or 0.1、um, on large scales、um, in disks, you know, depending on the stellar mass and the scale and, and so forth. So, if the disk is very massive, if it's maybe a tenth of the mass of the central star or larger. Then self gravity will definitely be be,、uh, be a very important、uh, process、um, in the、uh, in the disk. Then there's a third instability,、um, which I wanted to mention, called the vertical shear instability. And here, the physics that's involved a little bit of a subtlety actually about exactly what physics is involved. But let's say the main physics is hydrodynamics, and then there's also a role of the energy equation of the heating and cooling balance、um, within、uh, within the disk. So here you need Hydrodynamics.、Um, you also need some sort of thermal diffusion due to radiation or heating and cooling processes that is in the sort of right regime of speed, neither too fast, or in this case, fast enough, basically, so not too slow. Okay. And in these, so, so I'm being deliberately a little bit vague here because the conditions are somewhat complicated. But in the simplest terms, the condition works down to this. So this first term here is the gradient of the specific angular momentum with radius. Okay, so if we just had that, didn't have this second term at all, the condition would be that this radial gradient of the specific angular momentum had to be、uh, less than zero. So that's that Rayleigh criterion we were already mentioning for the fluid, purely fluid instability、um, in a disk, which is not satisfied in a Keplerian disk because the specific angular momentum increases with radius. However, here when we consider not just the radial structure. But also the vertical structure. There's a second term, which depends on the gradient of the angular momentum with height in the disk, dl squared by dz. And yesterday, when we talked about the equilibrium structure of disks, we noted that characteristically there is a gradient
in the angular momentum, the specific angular momentum of the flow, vertically as well as radially, even though that gradient vertically is much weaker than the gradient um, horizontally. So here, that vertical term is preceded by this ratio of a radial wave number to an azimuthal wave number. So that term can be quite large, depending on whether we're considering um, a very radially compressed mode or a very vertically um, compressed mode. So the point is, this second term enters with a negative sign. So even though this first term is always positive, under the right conditions, this second term can be large enough to over outweigh the first term and get us into the unstable situation where this is less uh, than zero. So this is an instability that was also known about in the context of rotating stars um, back in the 60s again. Uh, Goldreich and others worked extensively on it uh, back then. Um, in the context of disks, it's much more recent, uh, worked by Richard Nelson, Oliver Gressel, and collaborators uh, from just a, a couple of years ago. So less is known, basically, about this instability than about the other two um, I've been discussing. OK, so those are the, those are the in linear instabilities, the main linear instabilities. Um, what happens in the, in the nonlinear state? And with just a, a few exceptions, really one exception I'm going to mention, um, we can't really say very much analytically about the nonlinear evolution. We need numerical simulations to try to give us an idea of what these instabilities do. And the things we're interested in is, first of all, how do those instabilities evolve? In the linear phase, they're just growing exponentially. Clearly, they don't continue growing exponentially. Eventually, they have to, to saturate at some level. What is that saturation level? And then, what is the nature of the turbulence they uh, produce? So we're interested not just in the, the sort of strength of the turbulence, but also in its character. So in particular, for example, if there were vortices in the disk, um, as we've already heard a little bit about, and we'll discuss more about uh, tomorrow, those vortices would, could be quite important for concentrating particles in the early phases of planet formation. So you know, all turbulence is not created, uh, created equally here. Turbulence is just a bunch of waves propagating through the disk can have quite different effects for some important uh, purposes than turbulence that's in the form of uh, pressure bumps or vortices um, and, and so forth. So we'd really like to understand in detail um, what the turbulence uh, looks like. So let's go in a slightly different order here from when we discussed the, uh, the linear instabilities. Let's first of all think here about self-gravity. Okay? So here's a simulation of self-gravity. Uh, looking at the central star here, you're looking at the disk from above. Um, this would be roughly on a scale of uh, 100 AU on a side. Um, and here uh, we have a simulation of a, of a massive disk that is going to be unstable to self-gravity. So this is what self-gravity looks like. Uh, should be familiar if you've seen uh, you know, pictures of galaxies. Self-gravity in its nonlinear state leads to trailing spiral waves, um, which are sort of in this case transient and rather, uh, rather sort of relatively small scale uh, because the disk is not extremely massive. Uh, and those can just, in principle, persist indefinitely um, within, within the disk. So here what's happening um, is that these waves, the gravity of these uh, features, is leading to angular momentum transport, so it would actually be driving mass through the disk um, towards uh, the central star. So this is what we'd expect to be happening early on when maybe the disk mass is a tenth of the, of the, of the stellar mass or some number uh, like that. Now, this self-gravity is the, is the one exception to the rule that we can't say anything about the nonlinear evolution um, analytically. Because for self-gravity, actually, um, we can. And so the way we can, uh, we can do that um, is if we assume that the disk is not very massive, so maybe it's a tenth of the stellar mass and not five tenths of the stellar mass, then it turns out, even though it's not obvious, that the turbulence that is produced there can be treated roughly as if it's a local process. Okay, so we said yesterday that self-gravity in general shouldn't be treated as a local process because gravity is a long-range force. But if the disk is, is relatively low mass to a reasonable approximation, locality works, works, out, uh, works out reasonably. And in that case, we can use the condition that the disk sort of hovers at the, at the boundary of being marginally unstable to estimate um, how efficient the angular momentum transport produced by the self-gravity um, is. So the way this argument works is that you take this Q parameter and we say that everywhere within the disk, Q is comparable to this critical Q value, which we said is of order unity. Now, if the turbulence is also local, that means that, roughly speaking, the energy that is generated locally within the, within the turbulent disk is the same uh, heating that is balanced locally by cooling from radiation from the disk uh, surface. So we can use uh, uh, the, take the heating rate 
which in a, in a fluid disk is given by the product of the viscosity, the surface density, and omega squared, and say that that heating rate must balance the cooling rate, which in an optically thick disk is just the Stefan Boltzmann constant times t to the fourth, where t to the fourth is the surface temperature um, that the disk uh, has. Then by substituting uh, here, using the alpha prescription for nu, so we write nu equals alpha times the sound speed times h, and using this condition that q has to be remain fixed at this critical value, we can actually derive an expression for alpha in terms of the cooling time um, of the disk, where the cooling time here is defined as the time scale it would take for the local thermal energy in the disk to be radiated if we suddenly turn the heating off. So this would be directly analogous to the Kelvin-Helmholtz time um, for, a, for a star. It's the thermal energy divided by the rate at which uh, the disk is radiating. And the only other parameter that enters, apart from the angular frequency here, is gamma, which is the adiabatic index um, of, the, uh, of the gas. That be, so that would be five-thirds for a three-dimensional um, ideal um, gas. So how do we interpret this? Um, well, if the disk can cool efficiently, so if the cooling time is rather short, that means it's getting rid of its thermal energy very quickly, and so the turbulence has to be very vigorous in order to generate enough energy to balance that cooling, to produce enough heating to balance the cooling. So in practice, in a self-gravitating disk, this means the disk has to be very clumpy, and then, though, if you like, those clumps are colliding together and producing the heating, which is then being lost as cooling. So a disk that cools very rapidly, that can cool efficiently, has a high alpha, the gas will be flowing very rapidly through that disk towards the star to generate the amount of heating to balance the cooling. Okay? So this argument works for a self-gravitating disk because this condition for instability directly links the thermal property of the disk, its sound speed, to its surface density. So for the other instabilities, we don't have any kind of closure relation of that kind. We can't make this kind of analytic argument. But for a self-gravitating disk, um, we can. And the result then is, yes, that the clumpiness of the disk increases as the cooling time decreases. And generally, it's thought that if you go too far, uh, you won't be able to remain in any kind of uh, even quasi-equilibrium situation, and the disk will just uh, fragment into bound clumps of, uh, of gas. And those might eventually end up as brown dwarfs, or perhaps in some extreme cases, they might end up um, as giant planets. So as we'll uh, perhaps hear later, uh, if the cooling time is low enough, where the relevant parameter is this cooling time multiplied by omega, the expectation is that that would lead to, um, to disk fragmentation. Now, what about the vertical shear instability? Um, well, here I'm just going to show one, one plot from this, because uh, as I mentioned, this is a much more recent uh, kind of instability. It's not been explored so extensively. Um, so here we're looking at radius um, and height, um, and this is the amount of stress, uh, the alpha value locally, that would be produced from that um, instability. So what's being created here in these calculations are fluid stresses that have alpha values characteristically of about 10 to the minus 3 for, for reasonably 